Buenas tardes. Muchas gracias a todos por asistir a esta sesión. Eh, se va a celebrar la primera mesa redonda que está prevista en estas jornadas, una mesa redonda que se titula El valor de la industria europea del videojuego. En esta mesa se analizará la escena del videojuego europeo, su reconocimiento como sector cultural y su importancia en el presente y futuro de las industrias culturales y creativas europeas. Lo modera Carmen Paez Soria, directora general de Industrias Culturales, Propiedad Intelectual y Cooperación. Pues muchas gracias Héctor. Bueno, bienvenidos a esta segunda y última mesa del día de hoy. Tras eh, analizar el, el impacto del sector de los videojuegos eh, que se ha presentado con, con el proyecto piloto de Understanding by of European Gay Society y el Media Outlook Report, eh, bueno, vamos a tratar de abordar la relevancia que el sector ocupa en la agenda política eh, europea. El sector de los videojuegos es un sector netamente internacionalizado donde la competencia es cada vez más, más alta. Por eso potenciar el sector europeo es lo que nos va a permitir adquirir una relevancia en el escenario internacional que creemos que es la que merece. La capacidad de influencia de promoción y de defensa a nivel europeo se multiplica exponencialmente respecto de lo que cada uno, como Estados miembros, podemos tener. Por eso creemos que es fundamental hablar sobre qué se está haciendo, qué propuestas se plantean y qué más podríamos hacer todos juntos. Para hablar de todo esto voy a presentar a los colegas que me, que me acompañan. En primer lugar, Simon Little, CEO de la Federación Europea Video Games Europe, anteriormente denominada ISFE. Simon, bienvenido. Simon, tras una amplia experiencia en dirección y gestión de operaciones en el sector del software y consumo tecnológico, lleva 14 años al frente de la Federación Video Games Europe y además es el director del PEGI Age Rating System. Video Games Europe, aunque imagino que es de sobra conocida por todos, pero por hacer un poco de repaso, es una federación que se encarga de la promoción de la industria del videojuego y la defensa a nivel europeo e internacional de la legislación en materia de propiedad intelectual, el acceso a mercados y en particular la defensa de sus socios en relación con las iniciativas políticas y jurídicas que se debaten a nivel europeo. Pues bienvenido, Simon. En segundo lugar, nos acompaña Yari Pekka Kakeba, Director Ejecutivo de European Games Developer Federation. Bienvenido. Eh, además de, de director de EGDF, Yari es analista en materia de políticas públicas de NeoGames, el hub finés de la industria del videojuego y especialista en políticas públicas. Entre otras muchas cosas, ha trabajado además como desarrollador de videojuegos en Oulu y lleva más de una década involucrada en el seguimiento de iniciativas a nivel eh, político. Hoy, a través de EGDF, que se fundó en el año 2006, representa a más de 1.500 estudios de toda Europa. Y su objetivo es dar una voz a nivel europeo a los desarrolladores defendiendo el carácter cultural de los videojuegos y para ello inciden en la política europea. Pues bienvenido, Yari Peca. En tercer lugar, nos acompaña Martin Dawson, miembro del equipo de, eh, de la Unidad de Industria Audiovisual y Programas Media de la Comisión Europea. Martín es adjunto de la Unidad de Industria Audiovisual y Programas Media de la Comisión, que es desde donde se encargan de, a, de contribuir a la implementación del Media Action Plan de la Unión Europea, publican el informe European Media Industry Outlook y coordinan el programa de Europa Creativa Media. Además, han ido incluyendo progresivamente en los últimos años el sector de los videojuegos dentro de su enfoque, como un sector estratégico para la expresión cultural, el crecimiento económico y la innovación tecnológica. Bienvenido, Martín. Y hoy nos iba a acompañar también Iván García del Blanco, miembro del Parlamento Europeo y de la Comisión de Cultura del mismo, pero finalmente obligaciones derivadas del propio Parlamento le han impedido estar con, con nosotros hoy. Lo que sí le hemos pedido que nos mandase un vídeo para que eh, nos transmitiese un poco cuáles son los debates que se están llevando a cabo en el, en el Parlamento Europeo. Eh, creo que lo más interesante puede ser empezar precisamente con ese vídeo, ver qué mensajes tiene Iván que compartir con nosotros y a partir de él eh, iniciar un diálogo con, con los tres eh, magníficos profesionales que, que nos acompañan esta tarde. Así que... Si queréis, empezamos con el vídeo de Iván García del Blanco. 
Buenos días y gracias por la invitación. Perdón por no poder estar en Tenerife, lo lamento muchísimo desde muchos puntos de vista, pero hoy tenemos una votación importantísima en el Parlamento sobre la ley de la restauración de la naturaleza y, y nos jugamos el futuro, los europeos y las europeas, y cada voto cuenta. Hablando del videojuego, si hay un hecho incontestable, es que la industria del videojuego continúa en crecimiento. En el año 2022, esta facturó unos 184.000 millones de dólares a nivel mundial. Con previsiones de aumento en los próximos años, pues en 2025 la cifra se estima que alcanzará los 211.000 millones. En este contexto, Europa es la tercera región a nivel mundial, rozando los 33.000 millones generados. Se estima que en la Unión Europea más de 87.000 personas trabajan de manera directa en el sector para satisfacer a más de 428 millones de videojugadores y videojugadoras. También la Unión Europea alberga algunas de las grandes compañías de videojuegos a nivel mundial, como Ubisoft, como CD Projekt o como DICE. Y además de empresas de grandes cifras, en Europa destacan, y me quiero referir más especialmente a ellas, los pequeños y medianos estudios claves para la industria y el desarrollo europeo al representar a la mayor parte del sector. Pero más allá de su influencia a nivel económico, los videojuegos son un medio social y cultural de gran repercusión. Indudablemente forman parte de la sociedad europea y de su cultura. Las personas aprenden, se relacionan, se expresan, comparten sus experiencias y se desarrollan personalmente, entre otras muchas cosas, a través de, de ellos, de los videojuegos. Un sector tan, tan significativo como este debe ocupar un, el protagonismo que merece dentro de las políticas públicas también. Crear un ambiente cooperativo que incentive sus beneficios culturales, económicos y pedagógicos debe ser una prioridad para las instituciones europeas. Abogar por un ecosistema del sector del videojuego fuerte supone garantizar una fuente de innovación que permita transformar otros sectores, tanto culturales y de entretenimiento como aquellos que no lo son. Así, una sólida industria del videojuego permite un importante estímulo tecnológico y cultural, incentivando el desarrollo en la programación, la ciencia computacional y la inteligencia artificial, ámbitos clave para el liderazgo digital europeo. Esta mañana se ha presentado, mismamente esta mañana, el proyecto piloto del Parlamento Europeo Entendiendo el valor del videojuego en la sociedad europea que yo mismo impulsé. Es importante que conozcamos en profundidad el sector en Europa para poder tomar las decisiones más adecuadas que ayuden a su desarrollo. Además, es imprescindible fomentar la diversidad cultural que se origina en las pequeñas empresas del mundo del videojuego. Estos estudios independientes colaboran en mayor medida a la diversidad cultural europea al tener más libertad artística a la hora de concebir los videojuegos como formas de arte y cultura. En contraposición, a diversos videojuegos de grandes franquicias centradas en el beneficio y el éxito comercial. Un mayor apoyo a estos estudios les garantizaría aún más libertad que redunde en la calidad de la producción del videojuego europeo. Observando los hechos y viendo el gran impacto que un sector como el del videojuego ya está teniendo las generaciones actuales, se convierte casi en un imperativo que desde la Unión Europea se fortalezca y monitorice el sector. Con los videojuegos cada vez más asentados en la sociedad, siendo consumidos por más del 70% de la población joven, es imprescindible aprovechar su potencial pedagógico. Los videojuegos pueden ser utilizados como herramienta educativa que sirva para enseñar a la vez que entretiene a los alumnos, que atrapa la atención. El uso de videojuegos permite desarrollar una mayor concentración durante más tiempo, agiliza los tiempos de reacción, ayudan en el aprendizaje de idiomas e incrementan la motivación del alumnado. Además, pueden ser aprovechados para potenciar la alfabetización digital y la adquisición de competencias digitales imprescindibles hoy en día para cualquier generación. Con la transformación digital, miles de, millones, perdón, miles de nuevos puestos necesitarán ser cubiertos en el futuro. Los videojuegos pueden fomentar que los jóvenes encuentren su futuro profesional dentro del sector digital. Pero los adultos también pueden beneficiarse de las ventajas que emanan del uso pedagógico del videojuego al poder adquirir competencias mediante su uso. Queremos conseguir una ilustración digital a través de la educación. La colaboración del sector de los videojuegos educativos será muy valiosa para alcanzar este objetivo. Dentro del Parlamento Europeo hemos instado a la Comisión, a la Comisión Europea, a través del informe sobre eSports y videojuegos, a tomar las acciones que permitan visibilizar la importancia del sector a la vez que se desarrolla su máximo potencial. Por ejemplo, demandamos una mayor dedicación de fondos a través de los programas Creative Europe y Horizon Europe, eh, seguimos o sugerimos la creación de una marca europea de videojuegos para dar mis, más visibilidad y prestigio a las obras europeas y entre otras muchas propuestas demandamos que los videojuegos se utilicen como herramientas para fomentar la actividad física. De la misma forma que se ha reconocido la importancia de promover obras europeas en otros ámbitos del sector cultural, como el cine, también debemos reflexionar sobre la importancia de fomentar incentivos para apoyar el desarrollo y posicionamiento de la industria europea del videojuego en el mundo. 
Esto se podría hacer a través del respaldo a proyectos e iniciativas europeas, eh, así como de incentivos fiscales. En el actual contexto es imprescindible mencionar la inteligencia artificial. Existen diversas implicaciones de la inteligencia artificial y de los mundos virtuales en el presente y futuro próximo de los videojuegos, tocando un abanico muy amplio de cuestiones, desde la seguridad y la privacidad hasta los aspectos de propiedad intelectual. La inteligencia artificial está evolucionando muy rápidamente y tiene potencial para cambiar todos los aspectos de nuestra sociedad. El sector de los videojuegos también tendrá que adaptarse a este nuevo y cambiante entorno digital y además les genera muchísimas oportunidades. Por último, pero no menos importante, me gustaría recalcar la necesidad de aumentar la participación de las mujeres en el sector de los videojuegos y esta desde muchos puntos de vista. A pesar de algunos avances en los últimos años, las mujeres están infrarrepresentadas en este sector, ampliamente dominado por los hombres. A pesar de ser casi la mitad de los usuarios y jugadores de videojuegos, un 47%, aún no cubren una parte significativa de los puestos de desarrollo, diseño gráfico o ingeniería. Los videojuegos deben ser un sector inclusivo que pretenda conseguir la igualdad de género para generar así un ecosistema dinámico, económico y social más sostenible y diverso en torno a los videojuegos. Además, hay numerosos informes que hablan de los efectos positivos de un consumo moderado de videojuegos por parte de las niñas y su influencia posterior en la elección de carreras STEM. Ya se sabe la brecha de género que existe en estas carreras tecnológicas y científicas. Recalcar de nuevo la necesidad de colaboración entre la Unión Europea y el sector de los videojuegos. Tenemos que crear el entorno adecuado para impulsar los beneficios culturales, económicos y educativos que pueden derivar de esta herramienta. Como siempre reitero, el recurso más valioso de Europa es nuestra creatividad, nuestra cultura, es nuestra materia prima, no tenemos otra y tenemos que fomentarla. Los videojuegos son un ejemplo perfecto de ventana de oportunidad para potenciar el sector cultural y creativo europeos, sirviendo además como palanca de impulso para otros subsectores culturales y de refugio también, por cierto, para muchas profesiones artísticas. Muchísimas gracias por su atención y espero que tengan un intenso debate en Tenerife. Otra vez más, lamento no poder estar allí con ustedes. Gracias. Bueno, pues agradecemos a, a Iván eh, sus mensajes, compartir sus ideas y trasladar también un poco mmm, cuáles son las propuestas que, que se están debatiendo en, en el Parlamento Europeo. Eh, y hablaba de que eh, Iván planteaba como varios eh, elementos encima de la mesa, hablaba de que los videojuegos son un sector de futuro, creo que ya podemos decir que los videojuegos son un sector de presente, eh, que es un sector fundamental para, para transformar eh, nuestra economía, para caminar hacia ese modelo económico que, que queremos eh, y que, que necesitamos. Pero yo tengo una pregunta para, para eh, Simon. Vamos a empezar con Simon. Eh, ¿Qué crees que ha cambiado en los últimos cinco años, diría la última década, pero más intensamente en los cinco últimos años para que los videojuegos hayan ocupado un lugar cada vez más relevante en la agenda política europea. Ah, thanks, that's a good question. Uh, I'm, first of all, I just wanted to say I'm delighted to be here and actually that fits in with your question. We're here, that's a remarkable achievement uh, to be Forefront of, a, uh, forefront of a new presidency. Uh, so that, that shows how far we've come. But how did we get here? Why are we here now? I think it has been a steady uh, evolution over the years. It has been building slowly. Uh, but probably <coughs> two things have caused a tipping point, I think. First of all, we as an industry became too big not to be noticed. And I think the other thing that probably happened was, unfortunately, COVID. And uh, as was noted by an earlier speaker, we were fortunate in that the structure of the industry and the, the way our products are enjoyed allowed people to continue and to seek sort of refuge from COVID in the video game space. So they were able to stay connected with their friends, stay connected with the family through video games. And I think that brought video games to the front a bit more in terms of its cultural 
relevant. Uh, so that, along with the work that we at Video Games Europe and JP at uh, EGDF have been doing for the last decade in, you know, speaking about video games and its cultural relevance in Europe. I think it's all built up and we're finally here. It's great. Gracias, Simon. Um, Yari Peca, ¿cómo lo ves tú? ¿Cómo crees que ha cambiado? ¿Qué ha cambiado? ¿Cómo, ¿Cómo lo veis desde los estudios que representáis? ¿Qué ha cambiado? ¿Cómo notáis ese cambio? So for me, perhaps, uh, of course, what Simon mentioned, like uh, those general trends uh, have had a huge impact on the studios themselves. But at the same time, what has happened during the last 10 years is that the video game developer studios have found their own voice. The membership of EGDF has been growing year by year. When I uh, started to work for EGDF back in 2009, we were mainly representing Nordic and Western European uh, game developer associations. Now we have 23 associations as our member all across Europe, from north to south, uh, from east to west. And the focus of the industry is even transitioning to us to Eastern Europe uh, because of the all the recent development with the uh, uh, game dev exodus from Belarus and uh, Russia, as well as the Ukrainian war refugees. But all this has meant that there are more and more studios speaking or out about the work they are doing. We are seeing enormous success stories in Poland, uh, in Lithuania, in Romania, and across Europe. And combined, this voice, uh, of course, is heard by policymakers, and it, they are bringing it to the agenda. So we are now uh, grown up industry, something in the very core of the public debate. Pues totalmente de acuerdo. El, el sector ha ido creciendo, el consumo ha ido creciendo, la relevancia económica ha ido creciendo y les lleva a que eh, la agenda política preste atención al sector. Desde las instituciones... Martín, ¿cómo, ¿cómo lo habéis vivido? Porque al final, desde la propia Comisión Europea, se han ido asumiendo cada vez más iniciativas y cada vez eh, el enfoque hacia el sector de los videojuegos está copando mayores espacios. ¿Qué es lo que ha pasado también? ¿Qué, qué iniciativas o qué, qué cambios ha habido para que cada vez se le preste más atención? Well, I agree with the, the previous speakers. Uh, it's been an incremental process. There's not been one day where everything happened. It's just been building. And uh, I think the, the two factors I would agree with the previous, was previously been said, is the, you know, the spectacular, solid, consistent economic growth at the global and European level. You know, it's, it's a global phenomenon. And there also the, the COVID uh, crisis, which um, reminded people or made it even more visible the, the role that uh, <coughs> not only video games, but also video games uh, play uh, to entertain people, to uh, allow people to connect and uh, communicate um, the role that they play in life. Uh, Socially and uh, and culture, I think it became more visible. I think uh, uh, it would be interesting to ask uh, MEP Faring uh, what pushed her to do that uh, European Parliament resolution uh, back in autumn 2022, because I think she uh, that was a, that was a key step forward. That was a key step forward. I think that helped to nudge us. Uh, to include video games in our media outlook. I think we would have done it anyway, but certainly it helped to reinforce that. And, uh, and now you, uh, in, in the, the Spanish presidency, you are you're putting up your, up your agenda. Um, so, as I said, it's an incremental process. We have always uh, supported uh, video games to a certain extent uh, through the Creative Europe programme. Uh, that's the program that my unit is directly responsible for. But as the study showed, uh, this is a, a complex subject and there are many, many different uh, policy areas that are, con that are potentially concerned. So I think the question will also be how to take uh, forward the agenda across all these areas. I think 
it may be so obvious that none of us mentioned it, but of course the other thing that's driven us is the, the products themselves. The games are now easily recognizable to outsiders, to people that don't play games, as, as an equivalent to a movie or other cultural product, because the quality of the games, many of them made in Europe, some of the Ubisoft games, for example, it's clearly a cultural product in terms of the, uh, the way the graphics are presented, the soundtrack, the dialogue. It, it matches some of the best films out there. So why would it not be cultural? Sorry, just to, I forgot to, one important aspect. Um, virtual worlds. That is also uh, something which is uh, high up the political agenda. Uh, again, I think it started, I think we can safely say, across the other side of the Atlantic. <clears throat> but there is a, an overlap with video games, or at least we see a, an overlap with video games. Well, video games can play an important role there. Uh, and that could be a, a base from which uh, Europe can also play a role. Uh, in virtual worlds. I think that's, uh, that's a key motivation for us. There was a communication on virtual worlds uh, published uh, recently and, uh, and video games together with other aspects play, play an important role there. Yeah. The hotel from Finland was the first virtual world ever. So again, Europe was paving the world for the rest of the world. Muchas gracias. Creo que habéis recogido entre todos um, cuáles son las tendencias que, que le han hecho ocupar cada vez más espacio en, en la agenda política, ocupar esa, esa relevancia. Eh, creo personalmente que estamos al principio de, de ese reconocimiento en la agenda política. Hablamos de que el momento clave fue el año pasado, al fin y al cabo, con esa declaración. Y creo que, que son los primeros pasos para consolidar a la industria como un elemento fundamental en la agenda política cultural europea. Y además, creo que um, Iván García del Blanco planteaba también de una manera la potencialidad que los videojuegos tienen para eh, transformar la sociedad, ¿no? para contribuir a la generación de valores, eh, ese patrimonio que nos une y que, y que creo que es, eh, que es fundamental. Y hablando de esta potencialidad, y esa, hablando de que estamos al principio de, de ese camino de consolidar a los videojuegos eh, como elemento clave en la agenda política, lanzo otra pregunta a, a los tres. ¿Qué desafíos nos encontramos a la hora de consolidar a la industria del videojuego como, como referente? No sé quién quiere empezar. Yari, quizás. So, uh, from the perspective of the European game developers, I would uh, list four key challenges. The first one is, of course, access to talent. And on that side, we have to invest more on talent building, uh, on game education, institutions across Europe to secure that we have the best uh, emerging talent in Europe for, and route for the young people to the industry. But we also have to attract talent to Europe and secure that the borders of Europe are open for the best global talent to move here. And uh, we need to enable cross-border remote work because in the end, the idea of the EU is that you can work and uh, travel freely across the Union, but unfortunately, that doesn't work. The second big part is access to funding. And on that side, of course, we need EU funding, uh, like Creative Europe, not just the grants, but also uh, the media invest instrument on equity and loan sides are equally important to secure that there is funding for especially young startups to start their first studios. At the same time, we have to transform the EU state aid rules. As mentioned a number of times today, the general block exemption regulation is one of the biggest obstacles for the industry to build support instruments that it needs. The third big thing is access to markets. And on that side, uh, the platform regulation, especially the Digital Markets Act, is a huge step forward for the European industry. And hopefully it will live up to its full potential. But that, of course, uh, requires strong enforcement and implementation by the national authorities so that uh, these big mobile gatekeeper platforms are finally opening the markets for the European platforms as well. And the last one is access to data. And that is increasingly important part of the creative process, especially data-driven game design. And on that side, unfortunately, 
at the moment on the quick look on the recently accrued data act looks like it's not going to be a perfect solution by the step forward and uh, hopefully by working with that, uh, with the further regulation on access to data that secures that creators of the video games, even on the cloud streaming platforms, have access to their player data and they can use it to create even better games in the future. Those are the big challenges that we have to overcome over the next years. So, uh, gracias, uh, Yari. Um, Simon, algún desafío más? Pa planteaba Iván García del Banco, hablaba de, de la inteligencia artificial como desafío, oportunidad también. Uh, to jump straight into AI, uh, I think it, yes, it's a challenge and an opportunity for the industry. Uh, es el desafío para para todo, en realidad no para la industria, pero también. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, I think you know, as a an industry that that generates huge amounts of uh, graphical models and graphical data and so on, using AI to help the production process, for example, could be very beneficial. Uh, challenges, um, we're probably, uh, I think we're classed as a, a low risk uh, user of AI. Uh, so at the moment, that's not so much of a problem for us, but AI is developing so quickly that it's difficult to really foresee how it's going to impact our industry or indeed any industry. Uh, and in terms of the other challenges, I'm, when JP first started on his list of four things, I thought he was going to read exactly the same four things I've got <laughs> because I know we work together on uh, sort of four asks uh, of decision makers. And, and those four asks sort of fit into the challenges. And for us, really one of the big challenges, which I note got a full slide on the presentation earlier was uh, the need for skills. Uh, there is really a, a skill shortage uh, becoming evident in the industry uh, and trying to make sure that there is a match between the people that want to work in the industry and the skills that the industry needs is, is, is a big challenge. Uh, and <clears throat> I think it's been mentioned many times already today too is that there is an opportunity in that we don't yet employ 50% females, 50% males, 50 women, 50 men. Uh, so there's an untapped resource there in the, in the female talent pool. Uh, and as was also mentioned, video game players, video game playing girls are more likely to study STEM subjects. So that also feeds into the pipeline. So we're also, you know, hopefully helping to generate our own pipeline just through the, uh, the player base themselves. No puedo estar más de acuerdo. El, el papel de la mujer en, en el sector, en la industria del videojuego, la verdad es que es uno de los grandes, eh, de los grandes desafíos. Eh, son desafíos además que nosotros como Estado miembro también eh, compartimos, son prácticamente los mismos. Y creo que esa es una de las... Eh, Cuestiones más relevantes para la Comisión Europea, que al final los desafíos del sector a nivel nacional de cada Estado miembro son desafíos compartidos. ¿O cómo lo veis desde la Comisión, Martín? ¿Veis que eh, hay heterogeneidad? Que desde luego siempre la hay, pero... Uh, well, judging by the um, discussion so far today, uh, there seems to be a lot of uh, interest in... Uh, state aid, uh, but I couldn't possibly comment on that because uh, that's not my department. <laughs> so I do not represent the whole European Commission, of course. I'm here from uh, DG Connect and state aid <coughs> is the responsibility of DG Competition. But uh, it's, um, uh, it's a message that certainly has been underlined today. Uh, from our side, you know, the, the, our side of this picture, uh, I think we're already doing things that um, concern video games companies across Europe, across member states. So access to finance uh, is something we've been working on for years and with some success, I have to say. We launched a guarantee facility, a loan guarantee facility back in 2017, which has leveraged over 2 billion euro in, in loans. And about 10% of that, I think, has gone to video games companies. 
up to now. And this is something we're continuing to do, so every year there'll be more and more. And then, uh, as it has been mentioned, we, meant, we launched a, a financial instrument on equity, the Media Invest instrument, uh, which is uh, very recent, and we hope the, the first deal will be agreed with the European Investment uh, Fund uh, soon. Uh, but that is for audiovisual as a whole, including, including video games, for ambitious projects which, have the, um, which target audiences across borders, uh, which are risky but have a you know, very, uh, let's say, attractive, attractive upside. That's uh, an equity investment uh, platform. And I think uh, some uh, video games companies would be... Um, would have the right to, would have the right profile uh, for that. I think what's come across, uh, as in other sectors, uh, we always have this, let's say, uh, two-sided coin that we have diversity, we have dynamic, uh, creative SMEs, <clears throat> but to compete at global level with global players, big players, you need also to find ways to come together and to scale up. You need to find ways to pool investment. You need to find ways to research together. You need to find ways to uh, make productions that will travel and reach global audiences, to market them, to promote them. All that takes know-how and investment. So um, we hope these financial instruments will help scaling up also of, of, uh, of the industry. Um, it's not that... All companies need to be micro. It's not that all companies need to be global. You know, there's space for everybody. There is a range. But as we as we saw, as we as we know, the top companies, uh, you know, the top 20 companies are dominated by non by non EU players. And we also see that distribution distribution is dominated by non EU players. Uh, the all the, the consoles are non EU. The, uh, the app stores or the Android stores uh, are non-EU <coughs> and um, the distributors on PC are Steam, uh, uh, it's non-EU. So um, this is something to think about, I think, uh, for the future. Can I throw a question out there for discussion later in the session or, or tomorrow perhaps? Uh, of the report that we saw earlier, the recommendations, are there any recommendations uh, focused on trying to get more of the top 10, top 20 video game companies from Europe? So uh, the, the, the ones that were highlighted didn't seem to be sort of in that vein, but uh, you don't have the mic right now, but it's just something to, to, to maybe discuss later on is, is what, what we can do uh, as a group to try and get more European video game companies up there. And some of your instruments may well be that too. We'll see. Thank you. Sí, de, de hecho, ah, sí, perdón. Eh, de hecho, lo, lo comentaba eh, ahora fuera en, en el pasillo, lo, lo oía en distintos comentarios, que ese es precisamente uno de los grandes análisis. ¿Qué empresas son europeas? O sea, somos una potencia a nivel de consumo de videojuegos. Y en nuestra industria del videojuego hay que analizar qué empresas son europeas, qué es lo que estamos haciendo, qué estamos apoyando, qué tipo de diversidad. Nos, nos llenamos la boca y no nos cansamos de repetir que los videojuegos son un producto cultural esencial para la transmisión de valores, que son patrimonio europeo y, y es fundamental favorecer esa diversidad también. Entonces, yo añadiría que creo que, que lo habéis planteado y la verdad que el análisis desde un punto de vista más económico, de cuáles son los desafíos, es muy obvio cuál es. Y, de hecho, eh, tanto Yari Peca como, como Simon lo, lo tienen como muy bien analizado. Llevamos muchos años ya viendo. Pero hay un debate también más allá de, desde el punto de vista cultural y social, los desafíos que, que enfrenta también el, el sector y que creo que desde una dimensión cultural hay que poner también en, encima de la mesa. No sé cómo lo veis. I think in, in all these games, uh, and, and I have to, you know, uh, 
disclose, I'm not personally a big gamer. You know, my, I've got three kids and they, they, they play more than I do for sure. So I kind of, I'm from behind their shoulders, I have a look. And um, it's clear that embedded in the games, there are values. There are values, there are interests, there's a, there's a way of communicating, there's a, <laughs> there's a history or lack of history, um, there's a culture or lack of culture. So uh, the con <laughs> this is a very powerful, influential, popular culture. And so it's not banal, it's not neutral what the, the players are, are interacting with. So for sure, yeah, there is a cultural um, uh, stake. There's a cultural stake. And whilst uh, whilst the uh, EU industry is vibrant and growing, uh, non-EU industry is just as vibrant, if not more vibrant, and growing just as much, if not growing more. So uh, it's a train, let's say, that's moving fast. And the question is, you know, where, in which wagon of the train, uh, in which wagon of the train are we? And um, yes, yeah, so it's not uh, it's not indifferent the content that uh, <coughs> that we are that we are engaging with. It's not indifferent, culturally speaking. Mm -hmm. And of course, on the cultural side, we, we often our focus in is the bigger global productions, the AAA games. Some of them are, of course, coming from uh, Europe, like uh, CD Projekt, uh, Witcher series, or Cyberpunk, Remedies uh, games, or Quantic Dreams games. But most of the attention goes to these big productions. At the same time, there are 5,500 game developer studios in Europe, and as I said in the previous presentation, 70% of there are small or micro companies, and they are creating games as well. And there are hundreds of hundreds of games published each day, and those games, among them, is the European culture. And then the big question for us is, on the other hand, how are we making this European culture more visible? So that if you go search uh, from Google Store for, or um, Apple, Apple App Store, for example, games from Spain, you are able to find those great examples of the European and Spanish games. And on the other hand, we have to also start investing on the marketing. Like, um, it's the uh, biggest marketing budget at the moment for mobile games can be 100 million euros. And that kind of sums to invest in the cultural productions is something that on member state level is very hard to do. It's also at the EU level, we don't have that kind of budget at the moment. So how are we building these instruments so that when we have these great European games that have huge cultural potential, huge economic potential, they are able to access this kind of huge marketing budgets and grow on, so that we have those huge European success stories and we have among those biggest global companies also more European companies in the future. And that's something to solve uh, through the political debate. I had nothing specific to add on that cultural point. I think it's well covered. Thanks, guys. Um, la verdad es que eh, tenemos muchos tipos de, de empresas en, en Europa y, y hay espacio para todas. Y comentaba, voy a crear un poco de hype, si el secretario de Estado de Croacia me lo permite, porque lo hablábamos antes. Hay que fomentar la diversidad y crear productos y, y hay espacio para todo el mundo y que luego los consumidores tengan más capacidades para elegir. Desde luego apoyando grandes propuestas, pero apoyando también pequeñas propuestas. Entonces crea un poco de hype, ya te lo dejo para que mañana eh, puedas profundizar más eh, y, y sigo con el debate que nos ocupa hoy. Desafíos muchos, como estamos viendo, económicos, eh, más de industria, más de contenido. Eh, y el plan de acción de la Unión Europea para la cultura 2023-2026 recoge como una de las iniciativas ya favorecer o fomentar la, la industria del videojuego a nivel europeo. Tenemos los desafíos, tenemos el mandato. Planteen ustedes sus propuestas. Que, ¿Cuál serían las demandas? que desde eh, las asociaciones se tiene para las instituciones públicas, tanto las instituciones europeas como el papel que tenemos también los, los Estados miembros. Y también, si podemos saber qué tenemos pensado ya desde la Comisión, qué, qué iniciativas estamos trabajando, qué actuaciones, propuestas, si nos puedes adelantar algo, Martín. No sé quién quiere empezar. Si quieres, Martín, empezamos por lo que está encima de la mesa y luego 
que, que nos pidan. Sorry. We have this uh, big report on the table that we have developed with our brilliant uh, consulting team. It's been over 12 months of work. Uh, it's been a, a process, a major process, uh, and it's the first time that we have uh, engaged in that. Uh, thanks also to the support of the, of the European Parliament. And uh, it has been precisely to inform the discussion. I think it's, it's too early uh, to answer your question uh, directly. What we are doing is we're going to study carefully the, the recommendations, which are the fruit of this structured dialogue with, uh, with the industry, with, uh, with stakeholders. I think uh, we will also try and make sure as much as possible, as I mentioned, that uh, departments across the Commission uh, receive the report. I think it's important to, to raise awareness of, of the issues. And, um, and we will see also how, how we take uh, forward the uh, discussions with the Spanish Presidency. I know that you have uh, many plans uh, to discuss with member states and uh, I think the Spanish Presidency will be a, an important period in which to together to look at what could be some of the, what could be some of the options. Uh, I think uh, we need to be realistic in terms of the, the financing because uh, the EU budget is always very, very tight. Uh, and I just want to say a word of caution on that, if I may. The uh, review of the multi-annual financial framework was published, I think, uh, in recent days. And we know there are many you know, geopolitical uh, uh, priorities, uh, not least the, the brutal uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine and all the consequences that has had on the economy. And so, so there are many, many... Um, priorities at European level and in terms of funding I, I, we do not have you know, a magic wand to suddenly open new gates of funding but you know, through the instruments we have uh, which is Creative Europe but also beyond Creative Europe also Horizon Europe for research and innovation and the financial instruments uh, I think uh, Media Invest and the Guarantee Facility can play a, a big role in uh, leveraging private private investment. I think that's an uh, important area to work on. And uh, coming back to the issue of uh, talents and skills, I think there it, it's not a question necessarily of inventing something new, you know, uh, inventing new something out of the hat, but uh, there are existing. Um, uh, mechanisms like the Digital Skills Initiative, like the uh, Skills Pact Initiative with Digital Employment. I think it's a question there of um, perhaps making the most out of them and making sure that the video games industry, I think the industry itself, you know, engages as much as possible with the opportunities that, that are there. Simon. Me? Okay, thank you. ¿Quieres empezar con la lista? One of the, the things that, one of the questions that I came up with when I was looking at the presentation on the difficulty of getting the industry to engage with the education institutions was the makeup of the industry. It's, it's mostly SMEs or, or micro companies. And I wonder if, if that is one of the issues around the sort of professional approach between the industry and the uh, educational institutions. If there's something more that could be done to support smaller companies engaging with the, uh, with the institutions on their needs or training programs or whatever. Uh, but I, I agree with Martin, it, we're maybe, I've got a wish list of what I think we we should be looking for, and hopefully it matches what's in the report. The first one is on my list is, is as I mentioned before, the the need for for skills, uh, which comes down to JP's much more detailed point on immigration and uh, freedom of movement and being able to 
have a flexible workforce there. Uh, as we've already heard as well, IP is the core of the industry. Uh, so mechanisms to stimulate uh, innovation and IP creation and ensure that the value of IP in the games is understood from within the industry too in these micro and small studios. Uh, Martin talked a lot about creating facility support measures and that there may not be a lot of new money on the table. Uh, but I think a smarter approach or a more targeted approach might be what the industry uh, needs at this point. Uh, and I think that my final point would be looking at how better regulation can support the sort of industrial approach to video games uh, and making sure that regulation is appropriate for the video game industry. As was already mentioned as well, probably 90, 95% of the regulation that impacts the industry is not targeted at the industry, it's just stuff that we have to deal with. Uh, and just being cautious and, and aware that big policy uh, decisions aiming at other parts of the business ecosystem also impact the video games industry. Sí, totalmente. Mm. Yari. Uh, yeah, so I absolutely agree with Simon. And uh, perhaps to deep dive in uh, three uh, very specific teams. Um, the first one, uh, from the access to talent perspective, I already mentioned cross-border remote work. And this is uh, something that, especially for the regions like Tenerife, uh, would be quite attractive uh, opportunity for January and uh, February, perhaps March. But after that, it gets tricky for the companies. Like, at the moment, the general idea is that perhaps one or two months you can securely work remotely in across Europe. But the third month is already a risk, and fourth definitely is. And this is something that uh, is really, really against the very ideas of the EU or the free movement of the people and ideas and capital. And it's definitely something that uh, we need an EU level solution, security, the mapping of the rules in the different countries so that companies can securely say, for example, the Spanish employees work in Finland, that okay, of course, this is the amount of time you can spend in Spain uh, or whatever country you want. And these are the things from the taxation and social security perspective you have to take into account. The second big thing is on the public funding side is that we are seeing year by year more this kind of uh, public funding instruments for video games. It's clear that we have now the evidence base to finally include uh, video games in the general block exemption regulation. There is no question about that. But now it's just a question of time to act and to secure that finally the GDC competition is pushed to open the general block exemption regulation for the review during the next commission term and to include video games as its own exemption or under the audiovisual exemptions in a way that it's tailored for the needs of the video games industry so that all member states that at the moment want to build up the instruments to support their local video game developer on the cultural side are able to do so without this kind of heavy notification process in Brussels that is really hindering the development of the sectors across Europe at the moment. And the last point, uh, point ending the similar theme, as uh, Simon mentioned, on the wider regulatory context at the moment. And this comes actually on the upcoming debates that we are hopefully having on the number of other EU presidency events uh, on the video, specifically targeted for video games, is that video games have to be in the core of the debate. We have to be in the core of the debate for the copyright regulation reforms. Like at the moment we are implementing still the DSM directive and you can really see that it's not built from the video games industry perspective, there are a number of challenges of that. We have uh, data regulations coming, like Data Act, uh, Digital, uh, Digital Markets Act, uh, Digital Co Data Governance Act, and so on. And it's again clear that they are not built from the video games industry perspective. So now we are in the core of the debate, and the next part is actually secure that we are heard, and the regulation that is built up takes account of specific needs and challenges that the video games industry is in the fa uh, facing because that's the only way that we can continue the m amazing growth track we are at the moment on building digital growth and digital jobs for Europe. Um, efectivamente, al final los videojuegos empiezan a estar en el centro del debate y eso supone un potencial para la propia industria del para la propia industria del videojuego, también para nosotros como instituciones públicas el estar en el centro del debate 
también nos obliga a tener en cuenta los videojuegos en distintos tipos de actividades y de actuaciones. Entonces, desde luego, al final tenemos mucho potencial como industria y como instituciones públicas de, de camino por hacer y recorrer. Sé que voy fuera de tiempo y espero que no me regañen mucho, pero había planteado una pregunta que me parece interesante porque hablamos eh, de industria europea, eh, comentabas antes, Yari, eh, la, las actuaciones a nivel nacional y cómo a nivel europeo tendríamos mayor eh, potencial, mayor capacidad. Y una de las cosas cuando, cuando se habla a nivel europeo es la parte de colaboración entre estados. En el sector de videojuegos se compara muchas veces con el sector del cine, donde las coproducciones son cada vez más, más frecuentes. En el sector de los videojuegos aún no hemos dado ese paso o, o no vemos tantas coproducciones eh, entre estados. Entonces quería plantear qué podemos hacer también desde la industria o sea, para, para favorecer esa cooperación, ese diálogo, esas coproducciones. Simon, no sé si quieres empezar tú. Certainly, thank you. Uh, I would try to argue that co-productions have existed and continue to exist in the games industry, uh, but on, on a much less formal basis. Uh, either with uh, the use of uh, independent contractors who happen to be based and living in a different culture. Uh, that's at the sort of small SME level where you have a remote team uh, potentially collaborating across multiple borders. But also at the AAA product level, you may well have a game that's being developed across three different studios in three different countries. It's all financed uh, and managed by one company, but it is, in effect, uh, a cultural co-production uh, in terms of the geographic scope. Uh, whether that uh, is the long-term route for video game co-productions, I don't know, uh, but it, it works well for the industry so far, uh, and I, I'm not sure how the Film, the formal film co-production system would apply to video games. I'd be interested to hear more from the experts on that. So I absolutely agree with Simon. Like number of the leading European video games are actually co-productions. More big uh, European video game studios have a huge range of subcontractors across Europe, and they are using their services to create their content across the world. Uh, however, when it comes to co-production debate, the key issue here is, of course, a question of the IP and how to secure that um, when you are entering this kind of IP-driven uh, co-production, all the partners to co-production have access to it. And there is perhaps some specific areas where that might work at the moment. One of what we have identified is uh, this kind of um, building consortiums of the European companies who want to jointly build a bigger game. Those are existing to some extent uh, in some regions, but um, that's not really the market failure we are facing at the moment. I said those exist and there is funding available for those. Perhaps uh, co-funding instruments might be able to encourage that a little bit, but the impact itself would be much more limited than doing what Creative Europe program is doing focusing the funding more and more on the uh, innovative side of content creation, where the experimentation happens, where playing with the novel technologies, creating content on them, because that's where the new things are emerging. That's where you are building the future. And that's also the area that is extremely challenging to have uh, funding for, being it uh, your uh, playing with such novel technologies like voice interfaces, that uh, they are too risky to invest by the private funding. Being that the content itself is something that so new for the markets that the private investors don't want to, don't want to participate on that kind of project. Or the business model is uh, something related to, let's say, uh, we saw the huge boom with the play to earn and NFTs uh, in 2021, but the first experimentations with that happens already 10 years before it. And those days it was really challenging to have access to funding on that kind of business model experimentation. So that's the area where you can actually achieve much more than perhaps on the co-production side by securing that Europe is the place where the future is built. Gracias, Jerry. 
Two things. One area where we see uh, a need for more collaboration is virtual worlds, and where we see that video games companies uh, and talent uh, can play a big role. So as part of this communication that I mentioned, a number of initiatives are going to be launched, uh, some financed through Horizon Europe, to create new forms of partnership, collaboration, platforms, bringing, trying to bring the ecosystem together precisely to, to collaborate more, including through, through co-productions. So watch that space. And another uh, very practical step that we're going to take through Creative Europe is to replicate what we've been doing on the, on the cinema side uh, with our media stand, where we uh, traditionally go to film festivals and open a, a business stand to uh, help where we invite uh, independent companies on our stand like that they can participate in, in the market and meet partners and uh, find collaborators. So we will replicate that in, in Gamescom for the first time in Germany this year. And uh, we will uh, well, be the first time we have a media stand in Gamescom, so we will as learn as much as possible how we can add value, but the idea would be precisely to uh, bring uh, people, developers, companies who otherwise would have had difficulty uh, participating and help them access the market and find uh, partners and collaborators. Well. Al final, el, el generar también espacios de encuentro, de debate, es, es fundamental para, para crear sinergias y también es un poco lo que pretendemos estos dos días. Um, nos, ya, sí, ya acabamos porque veo que me cortan la cabeza, según señalan. Eh, no sé si puedo dar paso a alguna pregunta del público, si lo tiene alguien, alguna pregunta. Y si no, pues ya. Pues si no hay preguntas del público, una frase final de cada uno para acabar. Martín. Uh, onwards and upwards. Uh, I think uh, uh, we, uh, we are certainly uh, ready to participate in this growing discussion and to uh, see how we can mobilize our instruments in, in a smarter way, in a more targeted way. Uh, and we are ready to, yeah, to have this dialogue about uh, how best to have added value at European level. Simon. It feels to me as if this is almost the end of a long journey, i.e. getting to this event, to this level of uh, promotion within the uh, institutions, but it's also the start of, I think, an even longer journey. Uh, I'm looking forward to uh, reading the 280 pages, was it, report? Uh, and using that as a springboard for our work uh, at Video Games Europe for the next few years. Uh, so, yeah, it's an um, honor to be here, and it's, it's a great, great thing. Thank you. El honor es nuestro. Yari Pekka. So, uh, yeah, this has been a historic uh, day and for the video games industry because this is the first uh, dedicated event for the video games industry by the EU presidency. And we hope that this will be the beginning of a long series of the annual events uh, by the EU presidencies uh, focused on video game industry, inspired by the Spanish presidency. So thank you for that. And uh, let's hope that uh, at the latest Polish presidency, that is now the Poland, is becoming the, by the centers of employees, uh, the biggest country in Europe. So by, at least the Polish presidency will be the one that uh, take up the challenge, if not uh, any presidencies before that. Pues muchas gracias a todos. Efectivamente, es el principio de un viaje, que es la primera parada, son estas jornadas. Esperemos la primera de muchas. Eh, bienvenidos a las jornadas. Primer día concluido. Hemos lanzado ya muchos asuntos para mañana, así que esperamos veros a todos aquí y online mañana. Muchas gracias a todos y un placer teneros aquí. <risa>